Hello! In this video of the TranslatorsCafe.com channel, we will not talk about units of measurements of physical quantities as we usually do. Because it is the end of the summer vacation period, we will talk about vacation instead. We will also talk about different cultures and jamming GPS and mobile phone signals. A month ago, I returned from a short vacation which I spent in Crimea. I went there despite the Canadian government travel advisory which does not recommend going there, despite the fact that it happened one and a half years ago. For the umpteenth time, they talk in this travel advisory about armed groups supported by Russian military forces who took control of government buildings, airports and other locations in the Crimean Peninsula, and about its occupation and annexation. This video is my reflections on the current situation there, which I dictated to my cell phone during the 10-hour flight from Moscow back to Toronto. I will talk mostly of my observations about different cultures. When moving from one culture to another, many things become clear. Google knows everything about me. Look how it reminds me that I am going to Crimea today. Crimea, how I missed it, it's simply beautiful. For many Canadians and Westerners in general, it is an occupied and annexed territory. For some, who are less affected by the local propaganda, it is the opposite, a territory freed from the years of occupation. If you disagree, here's a short episode from my childhood, as a case in point. It is year 1959. My mother is a teacher in a Ukrainian boarding school, right here, in this building. I'm six years old and often go to mom's work. When I try speaking to students in Russian, they tell me I have to speak Ukrainian, or else they will get scolded by the teachers. Children in this school were not allowed to speak Russian, their native language for some of them, even during breaks and after school. So, who occupied whom? Now let us recall a bit of history. It's year 1854. There are enemies in Crimea, the English and the French. When I saw this memorial in London dedicated to the Crimean War, I realized that if Russia is weak, they could come back to Crimea again. Year 1941. Crimea is occupied again, this time by the Germans. They changed the street signs to the ones in German. Year 1954. Crimea is given to the Soviet Republic of Ukraine. This time, the signs were not changed, most of them were kept in Russian. Ukraine was, after all, part of the same country. This year, my parents moved to Crimea as settlers, through a government-sponsored program. Year 1991 Ukraine became independent. The street signs are changed again, into Ukrainian ones this time. Once, as I walked along the Welland Canal, which connects Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, I saw a hydrofoil boat, Vashat, made in Crimea, at the factory Moria, in Feodosia. The ship was bought by its new owners in Canada for a ridiculously low price, when the new Ukrainian owners were selling abroad anything they could make money on. Year 2014 Crimea became part of Russia again. After celebrations, people quickly got rid of the language which was forced on them by Kyiv. Year 2015, the first anniversary of the Crimean referendum. In March, the Prime Minister of Canada at the time, Stephen Harper, made another statement about the illegal referendum in Crimea. If I still lived in Crimea that year, I would have also voted for the reunification of Crimea with Russia, because the occupation for me was the Tumulus 90s. The occupation for me was the Ukrainian one. Well, Crimeans do not really care about what Harper thinks anyway. We are on our way to Simferopol with a connection through Moscow. We had to change airports and I wanted to use this as an opportunity for a walk in Moscow, where I haven't been for 23 years. We did not have a chance for it this time, though, because our flight was delayed by two hours. We only got to see Moscow from the windows of the Aero Express train. It felt a bit strange, but at the same time, my first impression was that nothing changed in the past 23 years. 
Everything looked very nostalgic. Wait, this is new and not nostalgic at all. There was no graffiti in Moscow in the 90s. I should mention that the Air Express train is an incredibly convenient way of moving between Moscow airports. When I saw the Moscow International Business Center, I realized that things did change a lot after all. A short subway ride from Kyivska to Pavelecka station proved that I need to change how I carry my wallet. Tarantanians keep their wallets in their back pockets, but Moscovites keep them either in the front pocket or in some other more secure place. As they say, when in Moscow, do as Moscovites do. A different culture means having to adjust or, in my case, to readjust to it, and I have to do it fast. This is what Moscow looks like from the Air Express train on a ride to Damodedovo airport. Now we are on our way to Simferopol. The flight was Moscow to Simferopol is currently half an hour longer than it used to be before a year and a half ago. This is because it bypasses Ukrainian territory, which you can see on the right. Descent into Simferopol. There is the water reservoir, and the city is a bit further away. This is Chaturdag Mountain. Last time we were in Crimea in 2008. The airport was empty. There were maybe 5 to 10 flights a day. We flew in on a shaky 2134, which felt like it was going to fall apart mid-flight. In the year 2008, the airport transported only 855,000 passengers. This time, we were on board of Boeing 747. There are 150 to 170 flights per day from and to Simferopol. The expected number of passengers by the end of 2015 is 4.5 million, quite a change. Two new terminals were built at the Simferopol airport, and several waiting and departure areas were improved. Despite these recent renovations, the airport can barely keep up with the increase in traffic. Our aircraft was parked quite far, several kilometers away from the terminal. Of course, Simferopol does not look like what Google showed us. Although, if you search, you can find something like that. Here's an example. This is all that is left from the factory that produced winemaking machinery, where my father used to work. When Ukraine became independent, probably no one wanted this machinery anymore. The first impression of Crimea was that nothing changed other than the street signs now being in Russian and the disappearance of the Ukrainian language. You can't even hear it along the southern coast of Crimea in the resort towns. But I will talk about this a bit later. In contrast to the airport, the train station in Simferopol is completely deserted. It seems that the only visitors there are cats and dogs. The only convenient way to reach Crimea right now is by air, using Russian carriers which have to bypass the territory of Ukraine. This is what the train station looked like a few years ago. Hopefully the passengers will be back to this station once the bridge across the Kerch Strait is built and connects Crimea to mainland Russia. There is no way back. Or so I hope. With all due respect to Ukrainian language, I really do not want to see the sign exit to trains in a language that was forced on us in school. Just remembering the Ukrainian poems we were forced to memorize in school, what a waste of the limited long-term memory resources. In the morning I went to the electronics market. I needed to get some old mic-based capacitors and a Geiger counter tube for the next unit converter video. There are rarely any tourists in this area. Every time I visit Crimea, I compare Simferopol to Toronto. In Simferopol we have lots of cats roaming the streets, while in Toronto there are lots of squirrels and raccoons. I like cats better. Yes, I know, I love them because I am used to them from childhood. 
cats are so friendly. They come over, let me pet them, and pose for photos, almost touching the lens with their nose. I don't understand why in Canadian cities squirrels are allowed to live on the streets, but cats are not. In Canadian cities, squirrels killed on the road are a common sight, just like in Russian cities with cats. Maybe Canadians do not like stray cats because if there are too many in the city, it is necessary to cover sandboxes on children's playgrounds. Here in Simferopol, it is so common to see cats that these three girls stopped to watch me to see what I was taking photos of. Maybe they thought I was making video of a raccoon. In spring, I really miss the mating calls of cats. Many Canadians don't even know what that is. In Canada, or more specifically in Ottawa, there used to be street cats until recently. And not just anywhere, but right near the Parliament building. It was a very interesting tradition. Unfortunately, a few years ago, this homeless shelter was closed and all the cats were adopted. The cats are not supposed to roam the streets in Canada. Many girls in Toronto look very awkward in heels. This is part of the local culture that we have to accept as is. They don't walk well in heels because they only do it once a year. Simferopol is different and much better. Here girls navigate broken sidewalks in high heels and short skirts very gracefully. It's nice to be back in Crimea. It is very unpleasant to see enormous fences in Crimea which hide the beautiful new homes. Next to these new mansions, just outside the fences, there are barely any sidewalk left and the asphalt is missing in many places. It's a paradise inside the fence, but as soon as you leave the paradise, you step into... Do you know what? I'm not used to seeing fences anymore. Time to get used to them again. In Toronto, it is not just the lack of fences, but there are sometimes no curtains on the windows either. I wonder why. This is the Cathedral of the Three Saints on Goggle Street. It was built for the Tauric Theological Seminary and is still used by the seminary to this day. Next to it are the seminary and the seminary park. Before, there used to be a school in this building, and later a research facility of the Padon factory that produced television sets. I used to go there for work. Now the seminary is back. I found most of the things I was looking for at the electronics market. It is interesting to see how it has changed over the years. In the 1980s, you could find anything here, because building DIY electronics was cheaper than buying it. The market was mainly for the electronics parts back then. These days, only a few stands carry electronics parts because do-it-yourself has become expensive and electronics cheap. On my way back, I took the Central Avenue, Skirov Avenue and then Karl Marx Street. I passed Alexander Nevsky Cathedral, which is in its final stages of rebuilding. This cathedral was originally built in 1829 and then blown up in 1930, 100 years later. It was replaced in 1944 by a memorial to the liberators of Crimea, a flamethrower tank. It is one of the two remaining OT-34 flamethrower tanks. The Alexander Nevsky Cathedral was the main cathedral of the city. The new rebuilt cathedral is quite different from the original. The three main streets in Simferopol are very neat and well maintained. They were like this eight years ago as well, last time we visited. And yet, one step away from the center and the manhole leads are missing. In fact, in some places there are no sidewalks either. After living in Canada for 15 years, I have to get used again to seeing gloomy shop attendants. This is also part of the local culture. Here in Crimea they do not get fired for looking unfriendly. In Canada they do. 
That's why they try so hard and smile, even if they feel like crying. I am paying for this. No, thank you. I prefer the gloomy crime and shop assistants. There was never much demand for books in Ukraine and in Crimea. Now they are gone from the shelves completely. It is illegal in Russia to sell moonshine, but making it for personal use is allowed. The law also allows selling equipment for making. Recently, due to the hike in prices for alcohol, there was an increase in production of moonshine. In Canada, on the other hand, making wine at home is popular. My school, which I graduated 45 years ago, has turnstiles at the entrance. This is new. When I went in, they immediately asked me about the purpose of my visit. Perhaps these days, if you ask a child on the street in Russia how to get to the nearest bus stop, he will run away instead of answering, just like children do in Canada. This was one of my first impressions of Canada, in fact. When, in the year 2000, I asked some 10-year-olds where the bus stop was, they ran away from me, as if I was about to kidnap them. This was very strange for me. Good thing I did not end up at the police station for bothering children. Whenever finding yourself surrounded by a different culture, it is so important to do your homework. Victory Avenue, Prospect Pabere in Russian, was expanded. This is the road that leads to Theodosia City, then on to Kerch, and towards the future bridge that is being built to connect Crimea to the Caucasus region. What a visit to Crimea without going to Yalta! We are off to Yalta tomorrow. We took an old bus to Yalta. This bus was long overdue for the junkyard. Same with the old trolley buses. Some of them are 50 years old. Although, maybe I shouldn't complain. We did pay only 300 rubles. The price of three cups of coffee for an 85-kilometer journey. In Toronto, this trip would have cost 10 times that price. So, we really did get what we paid for. Yalta is one of the best resort towns in Crimea. It is located on the southern coast of Crimea and attracts tourists with the gorgeous beaches and the stunning vistas. Yalta is on the same latitude as Genoa. Toronto is on the same latitude as well, but it is a lot colder there in winter. The climate in Yalta is subtropical. But if you ascend just 200 meters above the sea level, the plants are not subtropical there because the temperatures go below 2 degrees centigrade or 35 degrees Fahrenheit in winter. Winters in Yalta are very mild and the snow doesn't fall often. When it does fall, it melts quickly. Summers in Yalta are hot and autumns are mild. There goes the Gas 21 Volga. I used to drive one when I lived in Crimea. I wish I could drive here again. Yalta's promenade runs for a kilometer along the coast of the Black Sea. It is one of the oldest streets in the city. It was improved at the end of the 19th century. It was reinforced with structural blocks and decorated with granite. Steps facing the water were added to the promenade in the early 1960s. From the city side, the promenade is lined with palm trees and makes for a wonderful stroll, while the steps on the seaside are great for watching the waves. The promenade is undoubtedly the most favorite place for both the Yalta residents and the guests of the city. We continue our travels on the boat, going to the swallow's nest. The boat is rolling and pitching in waves. Cuna Hispaniola, which is moved near the Hotel Ariando, decorates the promenade. It was built in 1954 for filming a movie and now is used as a cafe. A larger ship to the right is Cafe Appelsin. Livadia Palace was the summer residence of the Russian Tsars. It is only three kilometers away from the promenade. 
This palace is famous for hosting the Yalta Conference during the Second World War, where the Allies met to discuss the post-war division of the world. Our boat is getting close to Orianda, one of the most beautiful parts of Greater Yalta. It is 5 kilometers away from Yalta center. The Azar Spa, which we will use to return to Yalta, runs through this area. We are walking up a steep path towards the swallow's nest. This castle was built on a 40-meter-high sheer aurora cliff on Cape Aitador in Gaspra. This cliff is named after the Roman goddess of sunrise. The castle was built in 1912, but in 1927 a section of the cliff was destroyed during the Crimean earthquake. The crack in the cliff was repaired in the late 1960s during the restoration of the castle. They inserted a reinforced concrete plate under the outside section of the castle to secure the building. Swallow's Nest is the most recognized icon of the southern coast of Crimea. If anyone tells you that nobody came to enjoy their vacation in Crimea this year, that is not true. See how I barely found a spot for shooting this video. The boat now goes back to Yalta, but we chose to walk back along the Tsar's path. It is also known as the Sunny Path. According to the photographer who let us take a picture of this barn owl for 100 rubles, these owls live in Crimea and are called Crimean steppe owls. This is not true. First of all, there is no such thing as a Crimean steppe owl. Barn owl, like this one, do not live in Crimea. Their natural habitat in Russia is only in Kaliningrad Oblast, while in Ukraine there are only about 30 pairs that live mostly in Zakarpatia. Let's take the last look at Swallow's Nest and turn toward the sunny path. I wanted to find the entrance to the path using the GPS and the map on my phone, but the GPS receiver stopped working. Mobile signals were also lost. As we found out later, this was because President Putin's and Silvio Berlusconi's motorcade was passing nearby. They later went for a stroll along Yalta's promenade. The signals were being jammed for security reasons. This is the first time I've seen something like this, even though I use GPS on my phone all the time. Later, we finally found the entrance to the Tsar's path. It was built in 1843 and was later lengthened to 7 km in 1901. The maximum gradient does not exceed 3 degrees, making it nearly horizontal. Back in the days when the Tsars and their families used to stroll along this path, they did not have such ugly fences. This path was renamed Sunny Path Solnichnaya Trapa, during the Soviet Union times, but the name does not fit it well. Even on hot summer days, this path is shady and cool. Here is an old trend shoulder pussy, or a European legless lizard. It looks like a snake, but it is actually a lizard. The front legs are missing entirely, and the rear legs are barely noticeable. There are fewer and fewer shelterpussics left. 
This is the only squirrel that we saw in Crimea. Here, cats replace squirrels. It's a different culture. Walk along the Tsar's path to Levadia, then catch a minibus back to Yalta's promenade. We were out of luck, however, because President Putin was visiting Levadia with Silvio Berlusconi, so the area was closed down. We had to walk around the area along the Alushta Highway. This doesn't even look like September. I love this promenade ever since I was little, although of course it could use quite a few improvements. This syrup is just like I remember it from my childhood. We had a shawarma for our dinner. Time to go back to Simferopol. We are flying to Toronto tomorrow. Yalta's bus terminal. <music> Moscow's Nukova Airport. We arrived at 1 am, but were not allowed to do the check in, go through security, and have a decent place to rest. As far as I can understand, this happened solely due to the stupidity of the night shift workers. They had very specific instructions to keep all the passengers for Toronto until morning, so that a visa specialist can check their travel documents. These people did not even try to consider that Canadian passport holders do not need a visa to travel to Canada, and hence can be let through simply based on their passport. No check-in until morning, and that is it is what we were told. We barely found a place to sit down and have a nap. All of the benches were taken. People were sitting and sleeping on the floor. Unbelievable. No, not unbelievable. This is simply a different culture. You just have to get used to it and accept it. It is very important in general to understand that when visiting a different culture, you need to follow the rules of this culture, not your own. You have to be mentally prepared. If you find yourself in Kyoto or in Osaka, you have to do as the Japanese do. If you are in Paris, you have to follow the Parisian's example. When you are in Crimea, you have to do as the Crimeans do. Teaching Kievans to live as the people who live in Simferopol do, and vice versa, is unproductive. It can even lead to violence. For example, it is futile to try to get Russian school and university students to stop making cheat sheets and using them during tests and exams, as a Scottish teacher Neil Martin working in a university in St. Petersburg is trying to do. Cheating is part of Russian culture. I am glad that I had a chance to do that too as a student, and that I did not use up my memory on useless facts. Besides, making handmade cheat sheets is one of the ways to study and remember the material. During oral exams, teachers can tell who knows the material and who doesn't, despite the cheating that is going on. Everyone understands that studying is not just training one's memory, it is primarily a way to learn how to be able to keep learning in the future. In Canada, it is the opposite. Cheating is not only banned, but also considered rude and socially unacceptable. On the other hand, it is acceptable to tattle on someone who is cheating. In Russia, reporting someone doing something wrong is generally considered unacceptable. People who tattle are considered the worst and treated like traitors. Yet, all this does not mean that the social rules in Canada, the UK or the USA are better than in Russia. They are just different. And 
You have to live by the rules of the country where you are living now. Cheating is part of my culture, and it is strange that a British teacher, whose job it is to understand these cultural nuances, doesn't understand this. You shouldn't eat Russians to live as Scotsmen do. You shouldn't believe that the Scottish way is better. This culture is just different. It is not better or worse, it is simply different. Remembering the picture of Simferopol that Google showed us on our departure day, I want to ask those who work at Google. Why don't you also show the views of the New York City with its smell of sewage when I am on my way to New York or Market Street in San Francisco that smells like urine of all the homeless people when I am getting ready to fly there? Do you not show all this because you are used to it? Because you walk past these streets on your way to the office every day? Well, you might be used to it, but I am not. I know I should get used to it, because this is part of the culture where I live now. It's just a different culture. It is not better, it is not worse, it is simply different and has its own benefits as well as its negative points. Anyways, back to our journey. It is now morning in Moscow and finally we can check in for our flight. After the check-in and security, we are finally in a decent departure lounge where we can sit down, watch the airplanes outside and even lie down. While on flight, I usually take photos and videos. However, this time we were not able to check in online well before boarding and get seats near a window. That is why I had plenty of time to dictate these notes to my cell phone. I hope you found them interesting. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to the educationaltranslatorscafe.com channel. Learn technical English with our videos.